Would you be happy if I told you that, yes, a ghostly spirit says I should kill you all and raise your rotting corpses as unliving servants? Well, not happy, exactly. I mean, that's not true, right? Body! It's time to heal! Stop burning me! We've lost Carillion! Sienna, no. I, um, I just wanted you to know I wish we could have saved your sister. Sophia? I'm sure she got everything she deserved. Yeah, but family's family, isn't it? True. But when you're dealing with necromancy, no one's ever really gone. Come along, darlings. Let's go save the world. I've been playing Necromancer Sienna for the last 36 hours or so, and I've got a rough idea how she works at this point. What exactly she brings to the table in the Ratman Northlander Apocalypse of Vermintide 2. Played some Kata duos, played some Legend duos, exclusively with the new weapons, and she's a very interesting character. She has a lot of really fun kit. I do not have enough time yet raising the Calcium crew to give you super powered optimized builds and specific breakpoints on her scythe or Soul Stealer staff, but I can give you a general picture of what to expect and some general build ideas that will at least help you get started. First off, Necromancer means Summoner, and for the first time in any Tide game, we have legit NPCs we can control, order around, and have engage enemies without lifting a finger ourselves. This new tech that allows for different factions of NPCs to fight each other will have huge implications for Dark Tide, a topic we'll talk about very soon, but for now, the implementation is fairly straightforward. Summon the Skelly Boys with your ult and have them be the vanguard frontline while you cast the Winds of Shyish and blow everything up on screen. The Boner Boys provide a nice cushion for you, both when they erupt from the ground to set everything in the immediate vicinity on fire and to keep opponents away from you while you keep the casting blasting. Do be aware though, the millisecond you are disabled by a Packmaster, Assassin, or Chaos Spawn Hentai Grab, your skeletons will immediately become inert and will not help you again until you're free. So if you're a true solo player and expected them to save you anytime you got pounced, you will be sorely disappointed. She has two new weapons, the Soul Sealer Staff and the Scythe. The Soul Sealer Staff shoots dark energy fireballs that can bounce to multiple enemies, lighting them blaze with a spooky green glow, and the secondary fire is essentially Psycho Brain Burst from Dark Side. Even on Cataclysm, it can one-shot a lot of specials, but will generally miss out on breakpoints for certain high HP enemies without specific builds tailored to killing them. Sienna's Scythe is her first great weapon, an armor-piercing but slow and relatively unwieldy tool that handles mixed hordes and armor fairly well, and has a special Gandalf Staff Slam that deals minimal damage but can be woven into combos to control enemies in all directions, basically sending out a necromantic blast that knocks everything down around you, gives you a lot of space. Her main passive is Malediction of Nagash, causing her magics to increase damage against anything she sets on fire by 20%, and that's her main green fire spell. If an enemy is ablaze from any of her staffs, they are being affected by Malediction of Nagash, and this has some super fun synergy with her talent tree and skills, more on that in a moment. In her potion slot, she begins with an Icon of Death, a skull that grants her mastery over necromancy, and Mistress of Death gives her greater control over those skeletons, with attack and defend commands and the ability to release their souls for a 70% venting purge of her overheat. So she can cast a lot. She can spam spells, swap to the Icon of Death, release a skeleton from its prison, then go right back to spamming five or six times in a row. As long as you have skeletons on the field, you can keep blowing stuff up by desummoning them to purge your heat and keep that casting popping. But the summon has a super long cooldown base. I believe it's 110 seconds, so you're not going to be able to cast it all that often unless you work in some other synergies here. Ideally, you're going to want to pair a casting focus build with cooldown reductions on your trinket and from your skill tree. Cold Flames makes all her fire DOTs last 100% longer, but there are some shenanigans with the tick rate where certain staffs end up doing less damage because your tick rate is halved, even though it's twice as long. But this isn't the worst thing because she has such an easy time applying Malediction with some of those old staffs. And finally, Life Taker lets her passively stack up to 10% extra crit chance on enemy kill, which has big time synergy with some of my favorite builds. I'm not going to read through all of her talents, you can do that on your own time. I'll just mouse over them so you can see what's up, pause it if you feel like you want to. But in her current form, 
it feels like there are a couple ways to play her. The first is as a melee frontliner, which sounds a bit weird for a necromancer who have always kind of been known as being a squishy, but it actually works pretty well. Reaping at level 10 grants 25% increased power and infinite cleave on critical hit, which means every time you crit with a scythe, you can cleave through bosses, chaos warriors, hordes of armor, anything. That affords a lot of control in and of itself. You inherently have high base crit rate from Life Taker and can stack that even further with 5% crit chance on your scythe and 5% crit chance on your trinket. Smiter always gives you 20% extra damage on the first enemy hit, and then things get really fun. Curse Blood at level 20 means that any enemy on fire hit by a crit will spontaneously combust, just outright explode, damaging nearby enemies as well. If you want to be super tanky, Curse of Undeath at level 25 grants an 80% damage reduction on the first three hits after summoning skeletons, which is huge, especially if you're just a decent or okay player that sometimes gets hit on Kata. For the pros, this might feel a little bit wasteful, but for like 95% of the player base, this will massively increase your survivability, allowing you to tank Chaos Warrior and Storm Vermin overheads even on Cataclysm and just kind of shrug it off. The problem with that particular talent is that it also triggers on Quelling or Friendly Fire. So with a Spellcaster build or a Trigger Happy Flame Drake or Hagbane Knife here on your team, it could be somewhat frustrating. Personally, I don't think it should activate on Friendly Fire. That seems like an oversight in a game where so many ranged weapons have AoE and damage over time effects, but it is what it is. It's guaranteed to cause some toxicity in your pub games. If it remains the same, I don't expect it to change before launch. We're one day away, maybe in a patch later on. If they get enough feedback, we can get that changed. So just don't take it if you're planning on cask and quelling a lot or getting shot up by pubs. The good thing is, Spirit Leech is a viable alternative for the melee build we're going for here, because anytime you kill an elite, which to be fair, she isn't the best at, you get 15% cooldown reduction on your summons. Why is this a big deal? Well, it takes what is normally a 110 second cooldown ultimate and makes it much more manageable, gives you a lot more uptime, and when you summon the Calcium Crew, not only are the undead rising from the earth to do your bidding, but you set the whole area on fire, immediately imbuing Malediction. At level 30, if we take Barrow Blades for the Skeletons with dual weapons and flaming attacks, we have a bunch of sources of damage over time, and everything we crit on will already be on fire, which means it explodes. Now you're starting to understand. Cast Flames from your staff to get the party started, cast Barrow Blades under an onrushing horde to set them all on fire, swing low Sweet Chariot into the midst of the enemy, cleave everything with your crits, and then everything starts exploding. There is a ton of synergy here, and you get to see lots of pretty lights, which activates monkey brain and makes you feel like you matter. Is Soul Stealer Scythe the best setup for this type of build, or indeed Necromancer in general? No, probably not. Remember that all of Sienna's old staffs are still available to her, melee weapons as well, and now they have their very own spooky green flame effects. I'd say the Soul Stealer staff seems solid to me, but I'd be surprised if it ends up being her best choice for a pure caster build. She has better staffs, and the scythe is a bit slow and limited itself, even though it is a lot of fun. But yeah, there are probably going to be safer options that leave you less exposed and deal more damage. In particular, I think the crow build could have great synergy with this type of build, because sure, flat horizontal swings make little sense on a weapon with zero cleave, which is how it functioned before, but with reaping, Crowbill suddenly has infinite cleave on crit, which could really turn it up quite a few notches and make it amazing with this setup. In terms of overall combos, it seems that Light Light Heavy, Light Light Heavy is a decent answer to Chaos Warriors and armor, as long as you're hitting those headshots. The Scythe innately has AP, and of course, if you crit, you can cleave and stagger all kinds of mixed hordes. It'll go right through that Chaos Warrior and hit, cleave the Plague Monk and eight clan rats directly behind it. And then Heavy Heavy Scythe Slam or Heavy Straight Into Staff Slam are good options for clearing hordes. One thing I will say about that is that if you're particularly unsafe, like fully surrounded, and there aren't a lot of Chaos Warriors mixed in, Heavy 1 Straight Into Gandalf Slam is really good for creating space, but if you're relatively safe or if there's tons of armor mixed in, you don't want to slam too much, if at all. For one, Slam will not stagger Chaos Warriors, so it's dangerous to side slam around them anyway because they'll just continue their animation and hit you, but it also makes it harder to earn temp HP if you're just fighting like slave rats. The slam is really safe and great for creating that space, but because it doesn't deal much damage and knocks everything down and away from you, 
it won't earn you any temp HP. So there's no reason to spam it after every heavy unless you're in a really dangerous situation. In some of my early gameplay, I was probably overusing it just because it looked cool and made me feel safe, but it's something you probably only want to use sparingly in accordance with the situation. When it comes to level 30 talents, from what I've seen so far, Army of the Dead is kind of ass, which may disappoint some people. I don't really see a reason to use this too often, other than maybe for memes or to feel extra necro-y, which to be fair is a perfectly reasonable reason to bring it, but it can do some funny things with the conch pot. Essentially, it strips away the cap of six skeletons, allowing you to summon as many as you can get on the field, but any skelly past the cap of six will crumble out after 20 seconds. With extra pot duration, you can get maybe three or four groups of them up on the field at once, and it looks really funny. It certainly makes you feel more powerful, and I guess fulfills that necro fantasy better than any of the other options. But from a gameplay side, when I brought it, I didn't, I mean, I just wasn't very impressed. Why do I think it isn't that good? Well, because even with Spirit Leech and the cooldown reduction, you're just not going to have that much uptime with extra boners, especially not in games when you're competing with teammates for kills. They don't deal that much damage to begin with, and only 20 seconds of extra skellies is yet another limiting factor there, so you're dealing with multiple layers of cooldowns and things that severely limit their output. Maybe if the Army of the Dead talent also came with an innate cooldown reduction so you could spam it more often, you could stack it up better, but in its current form, it just kind of feels underwhelming to me. Maybe people will be able to find awesome builds for it. Who knows? It seems to me more like a meme and fun choice than one that will help you dominate Vermintide 2. If you wanted to work on a more range-focused casting build, Death Ascendant for the stacking range power and enhanced power are the obvious go-tos. And you could round that out with Lost Souls, the level 25 talent that gives 2 temp HP and steals health from enemies whenever you purge 20 overheat. Now, obviously, Necromancer is really good at purging overheat. You bring out the Icon of Death, you suck away 70% overheat immediately. That will proc Lost Souls, but in reality, it sounds really cool on paper. In practice, I didn't really notice much damage or temp HP being generated from this talent. Again, it is what it is. I'm sure it's possible to get more value out of it than I did. I just didn't feel like it did a whole lot for me. At level 30, you could round that out with Dread Seneschal to get the tankier and higher damage skeletons that can charge and knock people over, or split up with three attacking, three defending. That's a solid choice, and overall, looking at our talent tree right now, I kind of feel like quite a few of the choices are maybe a bit underwhelming in practice, but she doesn't feel like an underpowered character, if that makes sense. The skeletons are great at what they do. They can defend choke points and hold down angles all by themselves. Her casting has always been fantastic, and that's not going to be changing anytime soon with this setup. Necromancer can certainly be a DPS machine, although killing bosses, as you saw in the last video, maybe not her forte, at least not with the scythe. And the skeletons honestly meet shield appropriately. They allow you to put forth an absolute deluge of magical might. They give you the space required to put forth that absolute pounding on enemies. Her unique kit is interesting and solid at what it does. She does have some very decent options, and with older stats and weaponry, perhaps even some OP combinations that I haven't explored too much yet. And most importantly, she's just fun to play. Definitely has a unique niche and playstyle separate from the other characters in the game. Summoning is not a gimmick. It feels like it informs your choices and meaningfully changes your approach to combat. You will perform better when adapting your gameplay around it, so it doesn't just feel like Fire Mage Sienna. It feels like its own thing. Obviously, if you don't like Vermintide's core gameplay loop, there's not going to be anything with Necromancer that will make you want to play it more. But for those of you who do like Vermintide, there should be plenty about this new class that you will enjoy. The combat, and especially the movement, do feel a little bit clunkier now, coming back from Darktide, without the ability to slide and crouch peek and all that. But as I've said many times in the past, the Tide games really don't have much competition from other devs when it comes to the feel of their melee gameplay. They're head and shoulders above just about everything else I've ever played on that front. I'm not sure it even needs to be said, but there are tons of things like writing and character interactions that Vermintide does better than Darktide, and coming back to it is a nostalgic and fun experience. Every time I come back, I enjoy it. The experience is still a blast, even five years on, and I think it's worth returning to every now and then. Let me know what you all think of the new Necromancer class and what you've seen in the gameplay, what builds you think will be really strong or perhaps worth skipping. And I'll see you all in the next video. Indie Pride, signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.